Kopp, the Dean of the College of Public Health at East Tennessee State University. And it's my very real pleasure to welcome you all to the very first Health Equity and Inclusion Lecture. Uh, this lecture is presented as part of the Leading Voices in Public Health Lecture Series uh, that has gone on now. This is its 13th year. Uh, but this lecture, this series, Health Equity and Inclusion, is one that we've decided to add. It'll be a recurring lecture every year, jointly sponsored by the college and by the Office of Equity and Inclusion. Uh, as with all of our Leading Voices lectures, the idea has been to bring in folks who are true experts in their field to both educate and challenge us and expand how we see the world. Um, a couple of housekeeping notes. This lecture is being recorded. It'll be available for later viewing on our website. And also, if you have any questions for Dr. James, please add, in, enter them into the question in the Q&A box or the chat box. We'll check those periodically. Everyone is muted, and so you can't um, you can't ask questions out loud. Uh, to introduce our speaker tonight, I'm really pleased to be joined by Dr. Keith Johnson. Uh, Dr. Johnson is the Vice President for Equity and Inclusion, as well as his academic position as the Chair of the Department of Engineering, Engineering Technology, and Surveying. I think I got that right, Keith. Um, and, it, you know, when Keith and I were talking about the interface of issues that his office deals with and public health, this became very obvious that this was the lecture we needed to have together. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Johnson to introduce our speaker this evening. Welcome. I'd like to introduce you to our special guest tonight. The um, person that will be speaking to us tonight is Dr. Kara James. She is the president and CEO of Grantmakers in Health. And prior to joining Grantmakers in Health, she served as director of the Office of Minority Health uh, at the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services, where she provided leadership, vision, and direction to advance the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and CMS goals related to reducing disparities and achieving health equity for vulnerable populations, including racial and ethnic populations, persons with disabilities, sexual and gender minorities, and persons living in rural communities. You know, under her guidance, CMS developed its first CMS equity plan to improve quality in Medicare, its first rural health strategy created an ongoing initiative to help individuals understand their coverage and connect to care, increase the connection and reporting of demographic data, and develop numerous resources to help stakeholders in their efforts to reduce disparities. Before joining CMS, Dr. James served as director of the Disparities Policy Project and director of the Barbara Jordan Health Policy Scholars Program at the Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation, where she was responsible for addressing a broad array of health and access to care issues for people of color and other underserved populations, including the potential impact of the Affordable Care Act, analysis of state-level disparities in health and access to care, and disparities in access to care among individuals living in health professional shortage areas. Prior to joining the foundation, she worked at Harvard University and the Picker Institute. Dr. James is a past member of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine's Health and Medicine Roundtable on the Promotion of Health Equity and has served on numerous committees. She has published a number of peer-reviewed articles. Dr. James holds a doctorate in health policy and her bachelor's degree is in psychology from Harvard University. Tonight, Dr. James is going to speak from the topic of understanding health disparities and what it takes to achieve health equity. So I'd like us to welcome Dr. Kara James. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson and Dr. Wyckoff and the entire team at East Tennessee State University. It is my pleasure to be here tonight to join you for the inaugural uh, health equity and inclusion lecture. And I'm looking forward to the time that we're going to have to spend together this evening. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my slides here and get this going. Um, so what I would like to do this evening is to spend a little bit of time to provide a little bit of an introduction to who we are at Grantmakers in Health, and then to provide an overview of health disparities, talk as well about rural health disparities, the drivers of those disparities, 
how philanthropy has been responding to health equity in this moment that we've seen in the last year is more um, individuals across all sectors are focusing on health equity and what it takes to achieve health equity. Uh, these are not easy problems and they're not easily solved. And so what it means to um, address these issues is critically important. And before I get started, uh, of course, I'm, I'm sad that I cannot be there in person um, to be in uh, the wonderful state of Tennessee, but I did have the pleasure of taking a rural road trip in August of 2019 with some of my colleagues from the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, as well as the National Rural Health Association. And we um, didn't quite crisscross the state, but we made it up to Sneedville, as you can see, uh, with the Hancock County Health Department. Um, and headed over to Paris, Tennessee, down to Bolivar, um, spent some time in Nashville and Knoxville and a couple of places in between. So did get a little bit of a tour of the state, but looking forward to the moment where um, we can all be in person again and get to get back to Tennessee. So, um, and yes, in case you couldn't see me, I'm, I'm kind of hiding behind Lisa from, from the Department of Health there, but um, it was a great trip. So grant makers and help, um, we are a what's called a philanthropy support organization. We work with foundations and corporate giving programs across the country, um, large, small, those who focus nationally, uh, state, regionally, as well as locally, to work towards better health through better philanthropy. We are um, been in existence for uh, over 39 years. Next year will be our 40th anniversary. And as you can see, we focus in a number of areas of, of work, including access, behavioral health, health equity is one of the areas, oral health, population health, healthy eating, active living, um, a number of spaces. We help our funding partners, as we call them, learn, connect, and grow. And um, we have in those areas of people who are working across the country. Um, and so you can see where our funding partners are. We would welcome more in uh, Tennessee and in the uh, region here of the uh, central, south central Midwest. Um, so what we are talking about today in terms of our health disparities. And it's good to sort of start off with a little bit of a definition of what we mean by these. So um, almost 20 years ago, the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, released a report, Unequal Treatment. And at that point in time, that was kind of a seminal report documenting healthcare disparities across all conditions, all sectors. And what fundamentally we talk about are differences. These are gaps between one group or another, but the difference is something that shouldn't be there. So it's differences that are related to the operation of the healthcare system and the legal and regulatory um, environment. They can be related to discrimination, bias, stereotyping, or uncertainty. But what they are not concluded is things related to clinical appropriateness and need and patient preferences. But what I would argue is that patient preferences, as we are seeing in today's um, world of who's vaccinating and who is choosing not to, patient preferences are malleable. And we do know that patients who are lower income, those with limited English proficiency, um, and in some cases, uh, racial and ethnic minorities are less likely to receive the information that they would like to help them make their determination. So um, while we in general do not include patient preferences in there, it is worth understanding that information can make a difference between whether or not an individual chooses to do something or not. And when we talk about disparities, often people automatically think about racial and ethnic disparities, but there are also disparities by sex, socioeconomic status, disability, geography, as well as sexual orientation and gender identity and others. And for the most part tonight, I'm gonna to focus on racial and ethnic disparities. I'm gonna also talk some about rural health disparities and a little bit around those for um, low income. But it's also worth noting that none of us live in just one of these boxes. I am um, a black woman who is uh, educated and lives in the District of Columbia, so I live in an urban area, but you know, we are looking at the intersection of how all of these factors come together and how they impact our health and access and opportunity. 
And why these matter, um, of course, is because they shouldn't exist. But fundamentally, you know, we have disparate, a diverse population that is getting more and more diverse each day. And so, as you can see, when we look at um, some of the latest data they have from the Census Bureau, um, although we're waiting on the 2020 census results, that you can see that about um, more than, uh, you know, 60% of the U.S. population identifies as non-Hispanic white. Um, our largest uh, racial and ethnic population is Hispanic at 18%, followed by Black at 13%. It is estimated that by 2042, more than half of the U.S. population will identify as a person of color. And if moral assuasion for the fact that these disparities shouldn't be happening isn't enough, one of the other things that we look at is the cost of these disparities. And it's been estimated that the healthcare costs associated with these disparities is in the as much as $200 billion to our system. And as we look at the growing healthcare costs and the unsustainability of that, as we become more and more diverse, if we don't address these issues, it also will have more and more financial complications associated with that. So let's talk a little bit. And um, I used to teach a, a summer course on health equity. So um, this is something that we're condensing into an hour for the purposes of tonight, but we could spend a lot of time talking about these. But I'm just going to go through and give a flavor of some of the disparities that we see. So we know that disparities start honestly at conception. Um, when we look at infant mortality, you can see that the infant mortality rate for um, Black and American Indian and Alaska Native individuals is more than twice that of non-Hispanic whites. We also see um, higher rates of premature birth and low birth weight um, also in these populations. And these disparities continue in terms of fear of poor health with um, Native Hawaiians, other Pacific Islanders, and American Indians and Alaska Natives, and even Blacks reporting higher rates of fear of poor health. So starting off life um, when a disadvantage that continues in terms of living sicker. One of the other areas that we don't always talk about, I could show you a lot around heart disease, diabetes, all of those things, and the picture is largely the same, but one of the areas that we don't necessarily spend as much time on that is so critically important is oral health. And when we look at the proportion of older adults with no natural teeth, um, and you can see that in 1999 to 2004, that five-year range, um, overall, we were talking about one in four, so 27% of older adults who had no natural teeth. And clearly, we've made a lot of progress as that number has gone down to 17%. But you can see that the gains have been very minimal for older Black adults, in which that change only went from 34% to 31%. One of the challenges that we have in doing um, health equity and health disparities work is that we often don't have data for all uh, some of our smaller populations. So you will see that this chart is missing data for older Asian adults, older American Indians and Alaska Natives, as well as older Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders. Um, but I would suggest that given the other um, data that we do have for American Indian, Alaska Native, older adults, these rates would be similar, if not probably higher than they are for older Black adults. And so when we look at disparities, again, that gap, and this is one where oral health um, and dental coverage is not part of the Medicare program. Um, it is not one of those benefits that is included in that. So there we have income coming into play in terms of people who have access to dental insurance as well as dental providers. So this disparity um, where it was much closer uh, between 1999 and 2004 for black and white older adults has grown and doubled um, in that time. So um, that's one where we are going in the wrong direction. We also see um, disparities when we look at the leading causes of death. And so how this um, plays out, we see higher rates of mortality for heart disease for Black uh, and American Indians and Alaska Natives relative to whites. Um, but we see also where these leading causes of death vary. So one of the things that we note is that the third leading cause of death 
for um, white Americans is chronic lower respiratory disease. So COPD is um, one of those uh, in that category. But you don't see that among the top five for um, people of color. What you do see in its replacement is diabetes as one of the um, fifth and fourth leading cause um, for each of the um, groups. And um, apologies, that is my work phone <laughs> ringing, but um, there you see that, you know, some of the variability in what is actually uh, causing that mortality for in, uh, each population varies a little. And as you can see, heart disease, we talk about as the leading, leading cause of death, but it's not the case for Asian and Pacific Islanders or Hispanics. And there you see cancer being number one and heart disease being number two. Um, and for Black and American Indians, as well as for um, Hispanics, unintentional injury um, being number three, where that's number four for um, whites and Asian and Pacific Islanders. So when we think about it, you know, every population, regardless of race, ethnicity, has their challenges. And the indicators of what um, those challenges are can vary. And one of the other things that we note is that there's a lot of cases where disparities are worse for people of color, but it's not the case for everything. And when we look at um, those issues related to um, suicide uh, or um, in the opioid um, epidemic that was happening, we see here that higher rates of mortality for those who are non-Hispanic white. Um, followed by American Indian and Alaska Native. So every population has their challenges and there's, you know, what we do in terms of addressing these needs and addressing these issues is really important. So that's kind of a picture of the health disparities, some of what we see, but there are also access to care issues. And so we know that having a usual source of care, a regular provider, increases the likelihood that you're getting regular immunizations, the likelihood that you will catch um, a condition early when it's most treatable and curable. But you can see here that more than half of American Indians and Alaska Natives report the emergency room or their clinic as their usual source of care. ERs are really expensive care relative to primary care. Um, and also does not have the benefit of having that continuity of care where you get to know your provider um, and see the, you know, that relationship in order to follow up and identify issues. Not to mention the fact that in the ER, they're treating whatever it is that brought you in and not looking at a comprehensive health care plan for you to be able to improve your outcomes. Um, we also see there are some challenges, not quite as great as what we saw there with the, uh, unusual, the usual source of care, but we do see slightly higher percentages of Blacks, Asians, and Hispanics who are reporting that they had difficulty getting needed care for illness, injury, or a condition. And so there we're talking thankfully less than, you know, one in five, about one in, one in six of the individuals uh, in the population, but the rate is almost double that for um, non-Hispanic white. And then when we think about, um, again, the role that income plays, when we look at those who delayed needed dental care due to costs, you can see that the rates are highest for Black, Hispanic, and American Indians, um, almost uh, comparable to those who are white and much lower for those who are Asian American. One of the things that we all know well is where you live matters. Where you live matters for so many reasons in terms of whether or not you have um, you know, access to social programs and insurance, if you have uh, jobs, good schools, all of those things. Um, so one um, example of what we see is that even when you drill down, most of the data that I've shown you is national data, but when you look at a local or county level, and this um, is an example of uh, the disparity between black and white Medicare beneficiaries with diabetes by county, so it's the prevalence rate, um, and the counties that have stripes are the urban counties, and those that are solid are rural counties, and the darker blue represents a greater disparity, a greater difference between the uh, black and white Medicare beneficiaries. 
So here it just pulled out the uh, information for Washington County, uh, Tennessee, and you can see it's um, a relatively small difference where um, for Black Medicare beneficiaries in, in the county, the rate of those who have diabetes is prevalence of diabetes is 30 percent uh, compared to 26 percent for uh, non-Hispanic white. So that can be, um, that's not too bad of a difference. Uh, you can see higher rates for some of those that are much uh, darker in color where that difference is more than 11%. So to sum up, one of the things that we have when we look at healthcare and healthcare quality is that at this point in time, given the most recent data that we have, which is often a challenge as well when we're looking at some of the health issues that we're trying to do in national data, there's a data lag. But for the past near 20 years, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality has put forth a national healthcare and quality and disparities report and has tra tracked healthcare quality across, as you can see, um, more than 200 indicators of health and access to care. And what we see from the most recent data is that for those bars in red at the bottom, that that's the percentage of indicate, those are the percentage of indicators where um, that group in the, the far left group being black is receiving worse care than whites for those indicators. So um, the number of indicators for which the data are available for each group varies. So you can see that for black it's 200 and for Asian um, it's 185, Native American it's 116 and so forth. Um, you can see the blue bar where about half of the measures across the board um, have equal care and similar care, the same care. And then in some cases, you can see that um, the green indicates that the group, the person of color is doing better than non-Hispanic white. And if you think about some of the data that I showed briefly, um, that may be, and in terms of Asian, for some of those where they have the lowest um, rate of health problems in some cases, um, compared to non-Hispanic whites. So we often refer to non-Hispanic whites as the comparison group, but it doesn't necessarily mean that is the group that is doing best. Um, when we look at how disparities have changed over time, so think from that first National Healthcare Disparities Report to the one that just came out in December, um, this is where we have a lot of work to do. And uh, as you can see, overwhelmingly, we are not making progress on reducing disparities. So they are largely remaining the same. And while quality of care is improving for everyone, the disparities are largely remaining the same. So we have to be intentional in our focus and not just assume that by focusing on quality improvement <clears throat> will we get to where we need to be. So to provide a little bit of context for what's happening in our rural communities. Um, this is a place where rural communities and um, often communities of color have a lot of similarities. And so we look briefly at heart disease and cardiovascular disease. So the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention put out a series of reports um, on rural health disparities and rural health uh, outcomes in um, 2017 every month for a year, there was a different focus. The first one is some of the data that I'm showing here in terms of the leading causes of death and what that looks like over time. And as you can see with heart disease, um, heart disease death rates have gone down and we've made progress. But there's been a little bit of a widening of the gap between those in urban areas and those in rural areas, uh, with rural areas being the dotted line. Similarly with cancer, um, there's been a slight widening of that gap. The downward trend is not quite as steep as that for heart disease. But we do see again that there's a little bit of a widening between those in urban and rural areas. Two other areas that were highlighted in that report include unintentional injury. Um, if you recall looking at the data earlier, that was in the uh, number four leading cause of death for non-Hispanic whites. Um, this is one where it's um, it largely remains stable, 
um, at periods with slight increases, but that difference is one where there's been really no change between those in uh, rural and urban areas. And when we look at uh, chronic lower respiratory disease, again, the number three leading cause of death for non-Hispanic whites, there we have seen more of a widening between 1999 and 2014 um, and little progress in, in that, but it um, one which we have some ways to go. That same National Healthcare Quality and Disparities Report also shows what's happening in terms of quality of care at a point in time for um, different communities by geography. And so, as you can see, um, we are, and this is the reference group here is large fringe metro areas. And if you look to the far right for those uh, non-core metropolitan areas and the micropolitan areas, you can see that about a third of the measures um, that we have those areas that are performing worse than the large fringe area. But overall, more than 60% of the measures are, um, the care is the same. So some disparities, um, not a lot, and, and so, but there's still more that needs to be done. And one of the other things is that when we think about rural areas, we don't really think about them as being very diverse, but there is, um, while not as diverse as some of the urban areas, there is diversity within rural communities. Um, I think about sort of my family in, in South Carolina and Georgia um, and other areas of the country, but also our tribal communities. And so when we look at within those rural communities, what's going on, we do see in some cases that racial and ethnic disparities also persist. Um, here is just an example of fair poor health among rural adults. And as you can see, there's about a 10 percentage point difference between Black and Hispanic, um, as well as American Indian and Alaska Natives, where uh, nearly 30% of them are reporting that their health is fair or poor compared to 19% of rural whites. Here, uh, for the those who have two or more chronic conditions, it's much closer um, where we see that rural whites and, and Black and American Indians and Alaska Indians, very similar experiences with much lower rates for those who are rural Hispanic um, and rural Asian and Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. When we look at obesity, um, there's, uh, as you can see, a, largest rates of obesity among those who are Black. And that green bar represents those who have a BMI of 40 or greater. So a significant um, a problem with obesity and the implications for heart disease, all sorts of other complications. But again, when we look at some of the other issues related to depression, here you can see that the rate between um, those who are white, as well as those who are American Indian and Alaska Native, is relatively similar. Um, but those, again, going back to that suicide number that I showed earlier, one where um, rural whites have a higher rate than many communities of color. So again, everyone has their challenges. And when we look at those who said that they could not see a doctor in the past year due to costs, we see that about one in four uh, Black rural adults and one in four uh, Hispanic rural adults is reporting that they could not see a doctor due to costs um, and lower rates for those who are white. One of the other things, again, in that where you live matters is when we look at the distribution of communities um, by race and geography in terms of rural, you can see that, um, and this is not a typo, but 94% of rural Blacks live in the South um, compared to 44% of rural whites and 59% of rural Hispanics. Um, you see larger percentages for American Indians and Alaska Natives, nearly 40% of them living in the West. Um, and for whites, about 44% in the South and 37% in the Midwest. So where you live matters and we think about you know, states and why this also matters is when we look at what's happening in our rural communities, you see the number of them who had hospital closures in the past 10 years. Um, so there have been um, more than, well, 180 rural hospital closures between 2005 and, and today, 
Uh, 16 of those happened in Tennessee with two um, in the past year with um, Delico Medical Center and Perry Community Hospital. Um, a number of these hospitals, if you look at the uh, far left here, so 97 of those 180 completely closed. Um, and 83 of those converted to something else. In many cases, those become emergency rooms or urgent care uh, centers, or they may become a nursing home or some other type of facility. But when we look at what's happening um, there, so as I mentioned, there have been 16 rural hospital closures in Tennessee. 10 of those are completely closed and have not um, opened in some other fashion. So access to care is becoming a little more challenged. And when the hospital goes, in many cases, so do some of the other providers that are there. And in some cases, the businesses that have been anchored with the community. Um, and when we look at closure, closure is the end of a long journey. But for a number of those hospitals, we see that they are in financial distress. And this picture, I'm sure, has changed with the pandemic because we do know that rural hospitals have really been struggling with the pandemic um, and trying to stay afloat. So at this time, which was just before the pandemic when this report was put out, um, you can see that in Tennessee, there were three hospitals that um, you know, were 20 in sort of their risk of high risk of critical access hospitals, that is high risk of financial distress, um, about 20% of those in that space, 20 to 38% were at high risk. So I would imagine that our, our two that um, have subsequently closed that I mentioned, Delco and um, Perry Community were on that list, but there are a lot of others that are, are really struggling. And as you can see in the South, much higher rates uh, compared to other parts of the country. So what are causing these disparities? And again, going back to you know, where I started at the beginning, some of those structural issues and some of the discrimination and bias that plays into what's going on. But we also talk about the social determinants of health. And these are the factors that are associated with where you live, learn, work, play, and pray. And so your community, your um, income in terms of poverty, employment, not just having a job, but the type of work that you do and whether that job allows you flexibility to take time off if you get sick um, or need to care for a loved one. Education, uh, as well as language and whether you are proficient in English, even though uh, we do not have a national language, we obviously do most of our work in English. Um, literacy uh, is really important in terms of your ability, not just to navigate the healthcare system, but to navigate the education system for your kids or the court system or whatever that case may be. Um, as well as the social and community context, thinking about social cohesion, civic participation, there are studies that show that communities with higher civic engagement have better health outcomes, um, as well as looking at health and health care. When we think about access to care and primary care, health literacy and the neighborhood and built environment, access to healthy foods, quality of housing, crime, violence, and other environmental factors. So the one that is probably easiest for everyone to understand, we, we think about income. And we see that across the country, about 19% uh, of um, households have an income below $25,000. And we see um, at the other end, about 30% who have an income of 100,000 or more. Um, slightly higher rates of those at the lower end for those who are black and Hispanic, um, as well as those who are Asian. And I mean, sorry, uh, black and Hispanic and higher rates for those who are Asian at the other end at the 400, uh, the 100%, 100,000 uh, income range. And again, like the disparities that we see, these, these differences start young. Um, so we see that about a third, uh, 33%, uh, about a third of black uh, and children are living in poverty and a quarter of those who are Hispanic um, are living in poverty. So starting young access to food, healthy foods, um, opportunities for health. Again, thinking about those who have foregone dental care because of cost um, is, is a challenge. 
And when we talk about poverty, I think that's one of the things that's also important because we throw around the number, you know, federal poverty level, like everyone understands what we mean when we say that. But the federal poverty level for an individual is about $12,000. Um, so if you make $13,000 as an individual, you are not considered poor in this country. Um, and for a family of um, four, it's about $25,000 that we're talking about. So that's, that's I, I think many of us would agree that if you are a family of four living on $27,000 or $30,000, you're definitely not rich, and most of us, I think, would consider you to be poor. But that is an important distinction in terms of qualification for a number of programs, food programs, housing, job aids, transportation, um, health coverage, and so forth. And these, like everything else, these disparities persist throughout life so that when we look at our older adults in terms of their median savings, you can see a large disparity between those who are Black and Hispanic and those who are white. We don't have data for um, older Asians or older American Indians and Alaska Natives. But why this is important is when we think about your ability to age at home and to age at home safely if you need to make modifications of a, a ramp or rails or whatever the case may be, or even just the ability to hire um, some additional assistance, a home health aid or so. You can't do that, um, you'd be really hard pressed to do that with 14,000 in savings. Um, so it's not surprising that we see for particularly older Blacks um, that they end up in nursing homes at, at higher rates compared to other groups. And the other thing to note at the very bottom of, of this slide is the percentage of older adults with any savings. So um, that if you look below, you see about 88% of all older adults have some savings, um, but that goes up to 92% for those who are white and down to 75 and 73% for those who are Hispanic. So um, fewer have any savings and those who do have significantly fewer savings. Um, and so we have um, income inequalities that impact the livelihood in, in older years of life. Um, again, going back to that older adults with uh, no natural teeth. And as you can see, um, not surprisingly, uh, the more money you have, the more likely you are to have some of your natural teeth. So uh, those who are less than 100% of the federal poverty level um, uh, are more likely to have none, uh, have no natural teeth compared to those who are 200% above uh, the federal poverty level. And we know that in rural communities, um, in general, rural communities tend to be um, less wealthy than those uh, in urban areas. But we also know there's great variability across all of these communities. There are some rural communities that are thriving and doing very well with a lot of high income earners and some that are really struggling with a lot of low income earners. Um, and when we look at the income distribution of those who are in rural America, you can see that again, we have some, some big discrepancies where we're talking 62% of um, Black rural adults with incomes below $25,000. Um, that is compared to the uh, about 32% that we were looking at in overall um, numbers and 53% for Hispanics and 56% for American Indians and Alaska Natives. So in general, our rural communities tend to be um, poorer than our, our urban communities, but even within there, we do see some of the disparities. One of the other uh, social factors I just wanted to highlight is, is it's so important in the US is health coverage. And um, today is the 11th anniversary of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, um, or Obamacare as people call it. And it has helped to limit the number of people who are uninsured and to reduce that from where we were. And we see that um, we do have a number of people who are still without coverage. And the type of coverage that you have matters. 
Uh, if you think about what, in terms of whether or not a provider accepts Medicaid or whether they accept Medicare or private coverage, it also matters from the provider's perspective in terms of the payment that they receive from that coverage. So we know that um, private coverage tends to pay providers um, more than Medicare, which pays more than Medicaid, which pays more than Indian Health Service and more than uh, the VA. So um, the type of coverage that people have also matters and is one of those things when we talk about some of the structural inequities that we have baked into our system, there's a little bit of the that in there already because Medicaid and Medicare cover different things, as does private insurance. So your coverage not only matters for your ability to access care, but the type of care and um, where you can go with that. Rural adults um, are less likely to have coverage compared to um, urban adults. And as you can see, that, that national number, as I showed earlier, was more like 11% of those who are uninsured. And here we're looking at 19% um, of all rural adults and um, higher percentages for those who are Hispanic and Black. And um, again, the um, when you look at those who delayed um, needed dental care due to costs, um, the type of coverage that people have matters. So those who are insured, um, only 10% of them said that they were, they delayed care compared to 28% of those who were uninsured. But again, the type of coverage matters where you can see that only 8% of those with private coverage delayed compared to 18% of those with Medicaid and less discrepancy between those who have been uninsured for less than a year compared to those who've been uninsured for more than a year. Um, the last, I, I go, I'm not gonna go through all of the social determinants that we talked about, but one of the other ones that I do wanna just highlight for a second is language. Um, and language um, matters in so many places from your ability to navigate and understand and communicate with your uh, providers and with those around you. So more than 62 million Americans um, speak a language other than English at home, and um, about 25 million, more than 25 million of them speak English less than very well. The top 10 languages, as you can see, are listed here. Spanish is the number one language spoken at home other than English. But the one thing that is also interesting about this, and I'm not gonna show this, is the percentage of the population that it speaks this language who is, has limited English proficiency varies quite substantially. Um, so for example, those who speak Spanish or those who um, speak Chinese tend to have a higher percentage of those who are limited English proficient compared to those who speak French or German. Um, so those are populations that are also very proficient in, in English for the most part, even though they speak that uh, speak another language at home. This is also interesting and in that um, this changes over time. So when um, I started putting this slide together almost 15 years ago, uh, French Creole and Arabic were not on the list. Um, and they have, um, as you can see, Arabic is not only on the list, but has risen to number seven over the years. So it's an interesting reflection of our um, communities and how they're changing and reflecting the dynamic nature of them. The other thing to note is that, you know, you did this at a state level, which we, we have um, done, you see some different languages come up and even down at a local level, um, other languages reflecting the needs of the community. So the availability of materials in other languages or interpreters who are there to help in a healthcare setting or in a school setting or wherever the case may be, um, really has implications for that interaction and the quality of that, of that care. So I've shown a lot of, of data in terms of disparities that we see, a lot of some of the challenges that both rural communities and communities of color face, as well as the intersection of the relationship of a lot of these factors. And one of the things that I hope that you'll take away from this is that these communities really do have much in common. Um, and it's something that um, I, I wrote about in our uh, blog last year in terms of creating that force multiplier. When I think about what are those commonalities that I see in rural communities as well as communities of color, there are a lot of challenges that are similar related to health, access to care, and the social determinants of health. 
Um, there's often a struggle to get the data needed to tell the story. Um, they, you know, sort of special ask or request to get that data. Um, it's not always easily available. It's not always current. It's not always available for all communities. And when we think about the difference between rural and frontier communities, trying to get some of the data broken down um, to look at frontier communities can be a challenge. Um, these communities are often excluded from many of the conversations where decisions are being made. And when we think about, uh, for example, what's been happening with the pandemic and some of the resources that have been distributed or some of the um, distribution of services and, and funding, not always thinking about it from that rural lens or thinking about it from an equity lens. Um, oftentimes, we, we find ourselves preaching to the choir, those who understand the issues, but again, because not always having that seat at the table where decisions are being made, having a harder time getting to the people who need to, to tell that story, to lift up. Um, both groups tend to be negatively stereotyped and misunderstood, um, as well as understanding that none of these communities are monolithic. There's a lot of diversity within those communities. And again, thinking about some of our um, rich rural communities and some that are really struggling um, and a lot of within the other communities as well. The other thing is that um, all of these communities know how to be very resourceful, you know how to stretch a dollar, know how to make a dollar go very far. If you invest in these communities, it's a good investment because you're getting a lot of return given the little bit of money that's going in there. Um, and that work, know how to work together as well. Um, and they also understand that these are not easy issues um, and that working to achieve health equity requires that we tackle some of the tough issues and the systemic pieces that have been put in place. So I wanna pivot for the remainder of my time and talk about what it means to achieve health equity and how um, in particular, you know, people have been responding to the pandemic and the social unrest. And in particular, what we've seen from the philanthropic community. Um, and so the responses have been really to provide a lot of flexibility to grantees in terms of streamlining requirements, removing caps on indirect expenses, as well as allowing grantees to repurpose um, funds for general operating expenses and delaying or waiving some of the reporting requirements. They have served as, as trusted resources in the community and are often doing that investment. One of the things that we do see is that there are fewer philanthropic organizations based in the South, which um, also means that there are fewer dollars going into those communities. Um, and not surprisingly, fewer um, that are going focused on rural as well. And it's one of the areas that we are trying to increase the uh, investment into rural communities. <clears throat> A lot of the foundations also implemented rapid response grant making. So trying to really get money out into the community to do what was needed and participated in pooled funds um, to maximize the, the reach of their dollars and continued to support programs for children and families as schools were canceled, um, helped to support food security as well as mental health services. And we know that that is going to continue to be a need um, as we come out of uh, getting more people vaccinated and, and back to opening up um, communities and businesses. And in some cases, those foundations also increase their payout. Specifically looking at rural communities, we saw that um, some of the foundations help those grantees access state and federal dollars. Um, we talk about some of the challenges for capacity to have that grant writing capability um, or even just to have the capacity to take the time uh, given the short staff um, the needs in some of these places. Also address food insecurity there, improved access to care and address some of the basic needs. Also focused on rural emergency services, uh, supporting telemedicine in ways that many of them already had, but also increase that uh, support for telemedicine, help safety net providers, and also kind of work together um, to really sort of leverage some of those results. We've seen that with the pandemic, there have been a number of specific you know, racial and ethnic disparities that have been highlighted um, from anything to higher cases and hospitalization mortality to lower vaccination rates, um, as well as decreased access to personal protective equipment, the nursing home deaths, um, location of testing facilities in some cases has been 
harder for um, communities of color as well as um, rural communities. The essential workers who've been there, higher unemployment rates um, resulting from the pandemic and businesses that have been closed, um, food insecurity, and lower participation in virtual education. So we, um, at the towards the end of last year, surveyed our funding partners to find out how they were responding to both health equity and the diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and we saw that, um, as you can see, many of them, almost all of them, were already doing health equity um, prior to the pandemic. But all of them, nearly all of them, eight and 10, changed their work following um, March of last year. And um, we saw an increase in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Some of the top challenges that they reported in terms of doing this work include the engagement of their board and, under and support from uh, helping them to understand how, why health equity is important and, and the work that they can do, as well as the internal capacity and limited resources, competing priorities, um, trying to deal with this amidst all the other things that um, they have to do, other internal challenges, as well as uh, difficulty in identifying what to do and where to start. Um, but we did see that um, post-COVID, a lot of people have been focusing on the COVID response, as well as looking at um, racial justice, access to care, health system transformation and innovation, and convening and coalition building. Um, and the populations that they are focusing on, as you can see, are largely, uh, and these can be multiple that they're focusing on, but um, Black, Latino, low-income, homeless, immigrants and refugees, as well as um, LGBT, LGBTQ community and those who are uninsured. So again, a lot of, a lot of that overlap. Um, what they've been doing, they've been issuing of statements and other calls, um, increasing support for grantees uh, led by people of color and focusing on vulnerable populations. Some have established health equity and racial justice initiatives. Um, there's also been expanding community partnerships and removing barriers to participation, talking about power sharing, how to not only um, identify the solutions, the problems that are needed, but how to co-create those solutions. We've seen a number of the uh, organizations who created diversity and health equity in positions within their organizations, as well as developing strategic plans that focus on health equity um, or structural racism, and identifying ways to foster more diverse and inclusive environments, as well as increasing diversity among trustees where they're able to. And one of the things that I thought was most interesting finding of our, of our surveys 40% even uh, towards the end of last year, we're still trying to figure out what to do. So I think we will see more to come. So where are we now? Um, well, we, we have a national strategy for the COVID response. Uh, there's been an executive order on an equitable pandemic response and a COVID-19 equity task force um, that does include a, a, a representative of a rural hospital a CEO who's on there to bring that voice and making sure that equity is across all uh, vulnerable and underserved populations. It's also the uh, executive order on expanding access um, to care and treatment for COVID-19, but we still need to support data infrastructure and analysis. Um, at this point in time, we still have a number of states who are not reporting vaccine data by race and ethnicity, so we don't know what's happening in those communities. Um, we also um, have you know, real needs to understand what's happening at a geographic level uh, to understand which communities are not getting it. So what do we need to do to achieve health equity? Um, well, the first thing is we need a common definition of it. I think a lot of people are talking about health equity, but we aren't all talking about the same thing. So we're providing sort of two um, sort of definitions, one from healthy people that defines health equity as the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. Or as the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation says, health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. What does that mean practically? It means we've eliminated or reduced um, disparities in healthcare and the determinants um, that adversely affect excluded and marginalized groups. 
So what does that really look like in practice? We talk about equity. Equity and equality are not the same thing. Um, and this is an illustration that can help to distinguish the difference. Equality means we give everybody the same thing. Um, whereas what we're trying to do with equity is give people what they need to achieve their goals and, and that giving them what they need is thinking about reducing those barriers. So if someone has a disability and you give them a bike just like everybody else, they're not able to use that bike. But if you give them a bike that's adapted for disability, then they are able to go and do what they need to do. Um, similarly, for you know, thinking about children, as you can see on the front. So we're really talking about reducing those barriers, which is kind of giving people what they need in order to achieve their goals. And what that takes is something that, you know, this is, this is hard work. I think one of the things is that we need to make health equity a priority. Um, we, before March of last year, I think there were people um, who were focusing on health equity, I, myself included, but those um, individuals and groups oftentimes were doing it with very limited resources, very low staffing. In other words, not really set up for success. Um, so if we are going to have health equity um, and to make that a priority, it can't be that work done by that office over there. It really needs to be integrated and be one of those priorities. Strengthening the role of leadership. What leaders talk about in public as well as in private signals what they're focused on. And because these are issues that are gonna take time, they were not created overnight. They're not gonna disappear in a 30, 60, 90 day plan. We need leadership that's going to be sustained um, and continue to support this through the long haul. Um, we also need to engage communities through humble inquiry. Too often we approach communities of color or rural communities with the notion that we know what's best um, and really should be coming with the understanding that these communities know a lot and we could learn from them as we are thinking about and addressing these issues. Supporting data infrastructure and analysis. It's not exciting to anyone except for the data nerds like myself and others, but it's critically important. If we don't have the data, we don't know where we have problems. We also don't know how we are doing in terms of addressing those issues and where progress has been made. Um, think about where we are now with the vaccine, where we were at the beginning when we were looking at testing and hospitalization, didn't have insight into certain communities to know. Um, and it's not, uh, if we don't address these issues, we're gonna be in the same place whenever the next issue comes forward. The other thing is, tackling those tough issues. When we think about income and the role that it has in terms of driving so many access to food, housing, clothing, shelter, all of those healthcare coverage, all of those pieces, we really do have to figure out how do we tackle those tough issues because without doing that, we're really only tinkering at the edges and not going to make meaningful progress. Uh, going back to that figure that I showed from the National Healthcare Disparities Report over how we've changed over time and overwhelmingly 94, 95% of the disparities have remained the same. If we don't tackle the tough issues in 10 more years or 20 years when I showed that figure, it's gonna look exactly the same. Um, the other thing is that we need to make health equity part of standard operating procedure. It can't be something that really is, you know, grant dependent. It should really be baked into how we do business. For example, um, if we're producing a report, um, looking at whatever the case may be, standard procedure is we look at that data by race, ethnicity, by rurality, by whatever the case may be that we want to have that standard. We don't have to do a special one. Um, also thinking about how programs might disproportionately impact certain communities as they're being developed and trying to mitigate those, asking those questions on the front end before it goes out. And then we hear on the back end about some of the challenges. And the other thing um, related to that is creating program and policy sustainability so that these can be here long after we retire and do the work continues. Um, and then the other thing is to develop robust pathline, pipelines and pathways to increase uh, the diversity of our workforce. 
we know that individuals from rural communities, individuals who are people of color are more likely to go back to those communities to provide services and care. And it's one of the things that as we think about how we can lift up a lot of these communities and empower them, developing more pathways to get people into all of the positions that we need, whether it be business, medicine, law, government, education, whatever the case may be. Um, but having that diversity of, of, of thought and viewpoint that comes in to help us develop better programs. It also means that we need to address these issues at every level. Um, when we think about this is a, a socioecological model of, of how we think about health from policy on down to the individual. And addressing equity means that we're doing this at each one of these levels. Could be in the community when we think about sort of research institutions or collaboratives, um, as well as the interpersonal thinking about families and providers and social networks. How we are addressing health equity in, at all of these levels is important. And I will close with um, some questions that as people are thinking about programs and whether or not there's a way that they can develop these a little bit more equitably and to think about those implications on the front end, some questions that can help do that are to just start with an understanding of what are the existing disparities in that area. Um, it, it's unfortunate you don't have to look too hard to find them, um, but a lot of these areas that you can see just starting with what's there. What do we know? And how will the policy improve or potentially exacerbate those? How might the change um, affect the availability of treatment and services for different communities? Uh, if you are if we're seeing a lot of you know, consolidation of some health systems and not necessarily those that are focused in um, what the needs are for our rural communities. And so how does that affect the ability uh, via treatment availability and services? How might the change impact the willingness of um, or availability of providers or if the case is you know, looking at some other program business or um, education to do that? What will be the impact of the ability to collect and analyze and report data necessary to evaluate the impact of the policy? And what resources are needed to implement the policy? Um, do these differ by populations? Sometimes you may need to give additional resources to support those in um, lower income areas or in rural areas in order to be able to participate. And finally, how have you engaged the communities you seek to help in the development of the program of policy? Making sure that they have that input um, and have been you know, engaged in the process will help to um, minimize the negative impacts of those programs and policies. So I think as we look forward, um, this is a really, it, it's, it's an exciting time, it's a hard time, but it's also an exciting time because um, never before in my career will I say, have I seen as much interest and attention being focused on um, health equity and, enough, and as much um, resources and support that's being driven towards this. I do hope that um, it's, we, we, in the moment that we have, I recognize this is a window of opportunity um, and that that window will close. And I'm hopeful that when it does, we will have made significant progress in actually lasting impact and that we won't have just tinkered around the edges. Um, but it is something that, you know, working together, we have much more in common than we do that is different. But I think that working together, we really can tackle those tough issues that will lead to better health for everyone and everyone achieving their highest level of health. And again, I thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you tonight and look forward to uh, the questions. Dr. James, that was outstanding. Thank you very much for that. And I say outstanding, but also somewhat discouraging, right? <laughs> Especially when you were laying out poverty across the lifespan. And But I appreciate you also taking the time to present how the disparities in rural areas are not always dissimilar to those from other parts of the country. A, a number of questions have come in and I'll, I'm gonna paraphrase them. Um, I'll start with the easy ones first. Um, uh, you know, you talk about handling the tough issues and that's, that's essential. One of the tough issues that comes up is how do you get it, this idea that we need to get healthcare to everyone one way or another. Unfortunately, when we bring that up, there's always, it always becomes politicized. 
And um, do you have any thoughts or advice for people that are engaging in that dialogue in a way that we can pursue it without it becoming sidetracked into uh, political ad hominem attacks or whatever? Yeah, I, I will confess, I don't have great advice for that because it is such a political football that we have. But I do think, you know, it's worth lifting up in a couple of places where we in the U.S., for all the money that we spend, and we do spend more money on healthcare than any other country in the world, our life expectancy is not number one, number two, number 20, or number 30 or 40. Um, so there is, you know, sort of that. The other thing is the way that we spend our money is different from a lot of other countries. So we take care of you when you get sick. We do not do very well at taking that ounce of prevention, which is worth a pound of cure. And so when you look at how other um, developed countries spend their money, it's much more in the space of prevention than it is in public health, uh, than it is in healthcare. I think the other thing that I, I lift up is that we have socialized medicine. So if you wanna see an example of socialized medicine at, at an extreme, I would say, it's the VA. The VA owns the hospitals. The doctors work for the VA. Everybody goes in. It's a closed system. You cannot, you know, you can, there have been some um, efforts to make it a little bit more, but we have that. Veterans get good care. It's, it's not, you know, a problem there. I think that that is something. And so I think that there are ranges of it, but I think helping to understand what that actually looks like when people talk about Medicare for all. If you talk to older adults, overwhelmingly we found whenever we surveyed our, our Medicare beneficiaries, they love it. They do not want you to take it away. Um, so that's a form of socialized medicine. It does not mean that the government owns the hospitals or owns the doctors, but it does mean that we say this is a defined benefit that you're gonna get that's available to you. And any doctor who participates in this offers it. Most doctors actually do participate. So I think that education can help people to see that um, it's, it's possible we're not all gonna be standing in line with some card rationing care out to people. Thank you very much, that's a good answer. Um, another question is we, we, we know it's important to increase the diversity of, of our, our health education institutions, both in terms of race, ethnicity, geography, we, um, any any thoughts, suggestions on how how we might do a better job of, of getting a broader diversity of students in our health education systems? Yeah, I think that's another one. I if if my other soapbox is education, um, because we have to do a better job graduating students out of rural communities into college, out of um, communities of color, because you can't. You can't diversify much of anything if the, high, the college graduation rate for African-Americans remains at 22%. If it's you know, 18, 15% for high school, uh, for Hispanics and less than that for American Indians. So we need to get further upstream. We've seen over the years, a number of the pathway programs that have been in existence have disappeared. Um, and we need to recommit to supporting pathway programs to get people from all sorts of diversity, uh, disability. I mean, there's been some focus on making sure that we have providers with disabilities because they understand that, um, that need as well. But how we do that, connecting those partnerships and programs with high school students so you get them earlier and help them kind of come through um, college and connecting them. And, you know, the mentoring, I think, Many of us have had mentors who've been really important um, and just been able to help them and guide them, guide us through our paths or just even bounce ideas off of what we're doing, but how we connect people so they see more opportunities. Um, and again, helping more people who look like them or have those same experiences who can help them, them through that. That's, that's great, thank you. Um, this being an academic institution, I had to get this next question. Um, you, you mentioned that you teach a, a course or you had taught a course historically. Is there a textbook that you would recommend or a, a particular reference resource that you'd recommend in that regard? That's a great question. I think uh, 
let's see, it's been a couple of years because I, I did this back when I was doing my summer program at, um, at the Kaiser Family Foundation. But I think, you know, if you want to learn, I still think unequal treatment is a great resource. Uh, you know, sadly, the numbers really haven't changed that much um, in terms of the disparities that are there. Um, there are others that are kind of coming out. I'm, I'm going to come back to you with that one. I will, I will send you a list of a few, um, kind of cultivate uh, a good list for you. But I think that you know, understanding how the system operates and how that works is also important because, as we say, these structural issues that are kind of baked into the foundation of our healthcare. Well, let me ask you a question. This is actually from me. So, <laughs> um, you know, we get we get frustrated at, as being a small, smaller institution in a rural area. A lot of funding, both federal and um, and even foundation funding, tends to go either statewide or to large institutions. And while there's been a lot of talk of focusing on rural America or Appalachia, we, we haven't seen a great deal of change. Do you, do you anticipate that there will be change either because of COVID or just because of increasing awareness of the challenges that we face? I am hopeful there will be change. Change is, change is hard. Um, but what I think, you know, when I, I think about our experience there at CMS, a lot of that money does go to the states because it's so much money with the idea of it's going to make its way into the community. I think there is definitely more pressure to make sure that that money does get into the communities. But I think, again, making sure that that you guys are at the table at the state level as those conversations are happening and represented and how you build those bridges and connections to make sure that you're part of that conversation so you're not overlooked is one of those. But I am hopeful that there those conversations are happening more. I would say even at the foundation level, um, we have seen some of the national foundations who are recognizing that they um, need stronger ties into local communities and to local areas, and they're working with some of the local foundations to help build those bridges so that they can get more of the resources to where they're actually trying to help. So I am, I am hopeful, but change takes time. Well, great. Well, l let me thank you again for all your time and, and courtesy and talking to us. It's um, I've, I've, several folks have asked that. If you, yes, I saw that to get the list, and I will send that to you. Okay, and, I, and I've written down their email address. Okay. Um, uh, so again, finally, thank you, thank you for for doing this. Thank you for being the inaugural speaker in this new series. Uh, Keith, thank you for co-sponsoring this with us, and um, to everyone, um, as always, thanks thanks for participating. So, have a good good evening, everyone.